Hello everyone, welcome and welcome back for a bonus episode with Dr. Lisa Cooper. I am so excited to share this episode, it's one of my favourite conversations. Lisa is a florist, artist, director of philosophy and author of the book, The Flowers, which is what our episode is about. We talk about ballet, flowers, process, violence and grace and so much more. I do mention in the podcast about how we met, so I won't say too much, but I like to refer to myself as a hot minute intern in her life and I stand by that position. Her book, The Flowers, which is available anywhere books are sold, is a great gift for an artist, an art student, anyone who loves plants and flowers, and it's just such a beautiful book to have in a home. Get yourself a copy, but before you do, listen to this episode. This episode isn't sponsored, so please share it with a friend. It helps the podcast grow. You can follow the podcast, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or follow me on Instagram at I am Barney Preet. If you want to keep up with Lisa's work, you can follow her on her Instagram at Dr. Cooper. All right, folks, enjoy the episode. I want to start with questions from the community because you had a few questions come in from your you know, supporters and people who love and support you. And then we might start and then we'll get into um, my questions and the book, which I'm so excited about. Um, it was published in 2015, but the thing about books is that they do transcend time. So I am so excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for making time to come on the show. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thanks for asking me, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not the first time I've asked you. I've badgered you many times, but we will come to that. I do want to talk about how we met um, and how this even came about but let's start with the community so this is just random questions so there is a dedicated chapter in the book about the growers but yeah. flower girl b 2000 asks will you tell us a little bit about the growers oh yes um oh god like you know i guess they're the center of my universe like um yeah they play such an important role in my work on a lot of levels Um, and I think uh, that yeah and they just have a really very important place in my heart. Um, They're kindred and I love them and I get to be near the flowers as they're growing and I get to know their families and their histories and yeah I've really just come to love them I um you will have read in my book about my well you will have read a lot about my childhood and Mm -hmm. my kind of genesis story and um my mother was Italian and so I have very strong links to Italy and uh Italianness and Italian people and it's all very familiar to me and the vast majority of the growers um, are from um, you know immigrated to Australia either this generation or the one before um, so there's there's just a real familiarity there yeah um, and in terms of my work it's just it's all critical um, I am able to see the flowers and how, you know, it's really important for me to see how the flowers emerge from the earth and to really study that. And the my growers are so generous with me, they allow me to do that. And then I'm able to communicate with them about what I think are the most astonishing things that they're growing or the way they're growing or, and it kind of, um, uh, you know, it can, it can affect, we, we kind of, we, we affect each other's work. So I'll um, see something that they think is imperfect or um, hasn't kind of come up in the same way as all the other uniform flowers and, and I'll be astonished and, uh, you know, want to work with those elements and that will cause them to continue to grow them that way or to cut them longer or to not only my farm visits but seeing them at the flower market um 
you know, we see each other at least three times a week and I give them trouble and, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> nag them and tell them I'm not paying that much. And, <laughs> um, you know, um, yeah, it's, we're very near to each other. It's such a great privilege because, you know, in my background I've um, worked with people from lots of different walks of life and had, um, I guess, yeah, experiences with other notable echelons. Um, but I'm my soul is uh, comfortable near these people. So it seems like you have a really intimate relationship with them. Yeah, yeah. And some of them have turned into great friends and, you know, I've watched their children grow up and um, at the beginning of COVID, there's one grower who said to me, um, if you get in trouble and you need money, you come to me. And I've just never heard anything so beautiful. Like, I was just like, oh, my God. And... Um, yeah, it was said a number of times. It really went into my heart. Isn't that quite astonishing? It's amazing. I've heard about people who have shown up for each other during that time. And I, I especially wondered with you and with the flowers and how how your relationships that you've invested in for so many years show up for you during that time. Yeah, well, that was like... I just, it just, um, yeah, it made me feel safe. Um, and it continues to make me feel safe because it's been, um, it's been scary, you know, it's been, I've wondered how I would, I've wondered how I would keep it going, but, um, I have managed to keep it going. Lady Glencoe 27 asks in regards to your process, where do you start? Is it the vessel, the shape and the size of the flowers or the space they will sit in? Oh, yes. Um, okay. It is, I mean, all of those things are in my head and they are established. Um, you know, they're, they're the types of things that I establish about a commission, of course, but um, the thing, I get, I think the starting point for a composition is the flowers, really. So um, having taken all of those notions in and having selected the flowers that I will use for a composition, then when I actually, when I actually go to make the work, um, it's the flowers that are the starting point. Yeah, it's the, the notion of doing them justice. So in whatever way that I can, I can see that they need to be seen um, in order to, to become both uh, hum, hum, harmonic and discordant and dynamic in order to achieve some justice to what they are is really the point of departure. In your book, you do talk about your process and where you do start. And sometimes it could start months earlier in conversations with people. Sometimes it's um, in the car on your way to the flower market, you know, when you're ruminating the day's work ahead. And you mentioned that part of your process and how it has changed over time but what I gathered was that it's always different you know it's always different because you're working with something so lively like so alive they are always new to me like yeah which is um yeah they're, they're always new to me I don't every season as it changes it you know when the roses come back or the bearded iris I I see them anew they're a different soul they're a different yeah so you 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 have that exactly right and to what you said about what I had written in the book that's exactly right like I see in the finished work and even in in the approach of the work things that yeah just ideas that might have that I might have had a very long time ago or just an idea that I had from 
from seeing a dynamic between two flowers at the flower market because you know the way that seasons work and is that um some years some seasons elongate and others are shortened by the weather and the way that it changes and so you will some years you will see um, two elements together that other years you won't, if that makes sense. So sometimes at the market I'll come across come across two things and think, oh my God, imagine. Yes, and I have to, like, <laughs> I can almost not. Um, yeah, I have to kind of drive quickly to, to be able to see it realised as quickly as possible. Oh, wow. My enthusiasm is such. Yes. And something that always remains in the book and you talk about is this awe that you constantly are chasing. And not just in not just in your work, but in everything. Um, Library Anne says, I'm fascinated by your words. Do you write poetry too? Oh, I know. Isn't that delicious that you would say such a thing? Thank you. I was touched by that question. Um, yeah, I thought I, I, I thought it was interesting because people have talked about my words um, to some degree and it feels the same to me. I think it's interesting because it, it feels what the combination of or kind of the composing of words feels very similar in my body to the composing of flowers. Um, and I think that it is a gift that comes from the same place. And I notice that when, you know, like I'm not, I'm not very good at having holidays, but when I'm forced to have a holiday um, and to put down the flowers, my thirst to compose words um, really gains on me <laughs> and I think people will have noticed it and they have noticed it on my Instagram that you know during the holidays I'll kind of write to more of a degree than I do when I'm working with the flowers it's just all composition it's all light and shade and texture and it's all the same it's the same it's like and I love the way that we, I love that words can be like knives and you can, I don't know, I guess there's a part of me that, that wants to kick people in the heart with my flowers. And I learnt a long time ago that I could also kick people in the heart with my words. Mm. Um, Lauren Rab asks, what advice do you give to novice florists? Um, oh, it's such an important question. Oh my uh, God. Can I, can I try answering it? And then you give the actual answer yes. based on your book. I think you would say, don't go to a flower institution <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or go and then learn how to break the rules. Yeah. And feed your soul. That's all I'm going to say. Now you go. <laughs> Darling. Yes, well, I do have, um, you know, I do have respect for these institutions and the traditions. Um, and I, and I do know that they, I think there's value in the fact that they put people near flowers, people who love them and want to be with them near flowers. But I, I just think that the approach is antiquated. Um, and there's just a, in most of these institutions, there's a, there's a real leaning towards trade, which of course, you know, of course, floristry is a trade, but um, I think it also is an art. And I could just as easily see it being taught in an academic context. The, the kind of connection between that kind of, um, dialogue between art and flowers is as old as man and there's so much to learn from art and it's 
uh, materiality and uh, conceptualness. So uh, I would say study art and in studying art, you will be studying form and color and spatiality. And I would also say um, just to work from love. I think that's a major component. That's what the flowers are and it's their purpose. Annalise asks, can you tell us a story of the bow? Well, um, obviously um, there is great connectivity between bows and ribbon and flowers and floristry. You know, in um, 17th century France and in the Victorian period and even the 1980s kind of plastic bows attached to carnation bouquets. I think that I picked up that thread, but I also think that, and I completely ran with it, of course, because I like to exhaust everything, but it also has to do with the first art form that I took exception to, which was ballet. Um, which I was absolutely obsessed with as a child. And I studied ballet, but my interest had more to do with um, the aesthetics of the discipline. So um, even as as a very young child, I was very interested in, and I didn't really understand what it was that I was seeing and I've comprehended it as I've, grown up, but um, it was, you know, the thing that really intrigued me was like the blood and the bone breaks and the focus and the attention. And I think that what I was recognizing was the ability to turn pain into grace. I think that's what ballet dancers do. I love them so much it makes so much sense now that your work because you do say in the book you know you did write I do not believe it is possible to create floral compositions or work of any other medium without a reverence for an intimate knowledge of one's chosen material you read that on page 247 and the fact that you talk about ballet and that you studied ballet and that you understood it 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 makes sense now that you understood early on what it means to discipline yourself and the the grace that comes out of disciplining yourself as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so a few lives ago, I did decide to study floristry. That actually, I didn't end up telling you, I never completed the course. Um, and I think that happens when you've done an art course because I did a Bachelor of Visual Arts at Sydney College of the Arts. So once you do like go to art school, and and you're you're taught to expand and just explode and um be so other that when you study afterwards at any other institution you can't help sometimes feeling um different and you can't help but compare and um going to art school made me realize this but when I did study floristry during that time I badgered you to take me as an intern Um, early on at that time I think I was really grateful because I understood your work but I also understood the gravity of your work Um, and you were so gracious and you let me intern for a hot minute and so I always refer to myself as a hot minute intern at your studio because I was just I went to I tell people I was like I went to a Vogue photo shoot I went to an Ellie photo shoot I went to a Chanel party and I went to your first candle launch and I was like that is hot man (laughs) darling you know oh I know I was so happy to hear from you again because um you yeah you (laughs) you do mean something to me um but I thought about it um and I wondered how you got in the door because oh God, yes. I can't quite remember but all I but I it is difficult for people to get in that door um 
there was um, yeah there's a lot of emails and a lot of um i'm because it's a studio um really i i just need a studio assistant and it's very um yeah it's a very private practice yeah and you mention in the book that it's not a place where you even meet clients you know it's a really intimate I would say holy place, you know, for your work to happen. And at that time, Sophie was your assistant. And so there was Sophie, there was you, and then I remember Bob. Um, yeah. And I well, just... It was probably Bob that it was probably, it would have been Bob that, um, that told me that I should allow you to come because that's, that was what Bob did. Bob was like it's okay. We don't have to be scared of people. (laughs) Yes. I thank you, Bob. Let's put it on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Because I felt like that was such a magical time for me because I had so much, I have so much reverence for you and your work and your work ethic and just observing you was enough. It was like, oh my God, I just want a little bit of that magic dust. Like, can you just put a bit of that fairy dust on me and I'll be away? You know, that's how I felt. Oh, yes, I do have to say the the part where it made me realize that I actually didn't want to be a florist and I didn't want to work with flowers is when I asked you um, while you were composing your ro- uh, your white roses, I believe, I asked you, you know, do you love, like, what do you love about flowers? What do you love about this? And you're like, I'm sick for it. <laughs> and every part of it, I was like, oh, I'm not sick for it. And that really like put me on the track of like, this is amazing and it's not for me and that's okay. Yeah. And I found something that I'm sick for, but I, I realized like you got to eat the shitty parts of the sandwich as well. Like you got to, you know, everything, it's the whole thing and you were sick for all of it. And so I'm really interested in what that is that for that hot minute, that not just for me, I'm sure a lot of people experience it with you. I'm definitely not the first nor the last. Um, to encounter someone and feel what I felt like was like that distilled spirit and someone that projects character that's like so palpable that can move souls and I really do believe not to sound so cheesy but I did feel like you have moved me Um, but what is that you know who was that someone for you growing up when you met them for a hot minute and then they left a marking on you was there someone for you growing up Oh my God. I love that. Um, yes, my, um, well, you will have read in my book that my father had a very big impact on me and he, it was a very odd childhood, Barney. He, um, I have questions. Yeah. He, he, I, you know, he was diagnosed, he was given six months to live when I was six. Wow. And he lived until I was 13. So uh, he had about six or seven years to um, impart all of the wisdom that he needed to. And it kind of presented itself as uh, it was philosophical intensity. So I didn't grow up with a television. Um, It was... Um, I, he, I was taught to meditate when I was very young. We had, um, he was a butcher, but his mother was a painter. My grandmother was a painter and he had a, um, a, um, kind of very philosophical understanding of what he, of his trade and its connection to art. So he would, you know, talk to me about how, what he did in butchery was akin to sculpture. And I think, and that's the chasm that opened up my perception of this slide between floristry and uh, the, you know, the trade of floristry and art um, and kind of enabled me to see the flowers as a medium um, of an art practice it's it, it's it's also I think just the blood that runs through me so you know my as I said my grandmother was a painter 
and my father was a sculptor and I uh, had a very intense childhood that um, led me to, you know, I think when I first started working with flowers and I was starting to be interviewed by the press, they would try to ask me these questions that would push me into the corner of, you know, um, that from early childhood I loved the beauty of flowers and that lovely story. Um, but the truth is um, that I saw, you know, in a way I saw him dissolve um, or evaporate or because he had a kind of cancer that acted like AIDS. So he's, he's a, a very big man and then he was pretty much skeletal by the end. And so my obsession with beauty is that, and I think of it all the time with the flowers is like, I feel like the greatest success in my work is where I capture them in the fullest flight of life. That's when I cry in the studio is when I'm like, I look at a composition and I think, oh my fucking God, like I've got it. I've got every one of them is as alive as they will ever be. And I've, I've held them at that moment. Wow. Yeah. I don't even know if you asked me oh, about that. Oh, I don't even <laughs> care. No, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. This yeah. is your episode, Lisa. <laughs> Do you have the book with you nearby? Oh, yes. I. It's in my bookshelf. Will you grab yeah. it for me, please? Yes. Okay, I have the book. Okay. Will you please go to page 15 and read the last paragraph? Yes. Oh, Barney, this is cruel and unusual. It took my breath away. You ha- you must. Once my father said something to me that pierced me to the core. We were in the Blue Mountains, about an hour and a half inland from Sydney, standing at Echo Point, the place to look out across the awesome Jamison Valley. We were silenced by the breathtaking grandeur and the optically distorted panorama. Spread out before us were thousands upon thousands of enormous ancient trees and billions of green leaves, leaves so dense that you felt you could jump off the rocky outcrop into that vast soft blanket of green. After some time, my father turned to me and said, every leaf on every tree you see out there represents the opportunities that you will have in this life. Some words like seeds. My favourite part. (laughs) In the book, you do talk about witnessing your father's character, the act of butchering, charming his customers and trading his produce. You wrote, while my daily life is punctuated by myriad insecurities in the studio, I possess a resolute and determined belief in my ability to sense, distinguish and create beauty. Where does that determined belief come from? Oh my God, from the center of my soul. I, um, like some of my earliest memories are, um, of my perception of aesthetics. So I, um, I remember as a three-year-old, um, I'm just, uh, making choices between, um between what I thought was acceptable and what wasn't like my mother's cups and sauces and my you know my world was very small but I was able but I would in that little tiny world I would choose what was acceptable so I thought that my grandmother's cups were far superior to my mother's and um it was the same with um the clothes that my that I you know my mother would dress me in I had very definite opinions it was all pervasive really um and the same with people and that has really continued I'm a very swift judge of what 
energy I well what yeah what energy and things I'll have near me but um more directly to the quote that you um just used um I oh my god I'm so uh eccentric and um odd and I worry about everything and uh, I think I'm not beautiful enough and I think that everything is cause for worry and (laughs) concern um but when I am with the flowers in the studio I know exactly what needs to happen and I don't I know exactly I have a very definite command of the material I don't question it I don't believe that anybody else knows better I mean the finest person on the planet in you know the captain of some industry might say that the work isn't sufficient but I would believe myself before them wow yeah but it works in the other direction too so I it works in the other direction in that I um I'm very I can be very critical I can see I can see where I have failed every single time yeah but I don't think anybody knows better than me how the flower should be. Have you always had that belief coming from that determined dis- understanding and dis- discerning you, your judgments growing up and making those judgments like you just believed that from as early as like working in a flower shop while you're doing your thesis? Like, did you know it then? I knew, well, of course I knew when I was a very small child um, what I thought was beautiful and I didn't really question it yeah. and then um or p- beautiful and correct and um as it should be mm-hmm. in this world mm-hmm. um uh of my reckoning um but it really the the laser focus that the feeling of like it really happened when I when I picked up the flowers I've never I've, I've studied a lot of art forms and for a lot of years. So I, I just painted for three years um, and I painted in only tones of white because I thought that the attention and uh, the focus of that would teach me, uh, would, would give me a practice of and a command of texture without having to be influenced by colour um and I've sculpted and I've made video art and projection and um and when I picked up the flowers I was just like oh my god like I I I can do what's in my head I can make them dance Mm. yeah it's a powerful feeling it was like a uh finding your purpose I think it comes back to what we were talking about, about poetry. Like your, the, it comes from the same place. The medium may change, but the distinction of what you know is correct and beautiful remains. So the approach, is that true? Um, in terms of like the energy that still remains in, in that approach, but the medium, whether it changes or not, is what it is. Yeah, because, you know, you can't, because in order to put creative work into the world, uh, I believe that, you know, there has to be vulnerability, but it also takes extraordinary bravery. And, and I have that. I, I, for all my failings and all my weakness and vulnerability, I'm not afraid to put my work into the world. Mm. Um, 
Yeah. Does that answer that? It does answer the question. Okay. Good. On page 122 of the book, you wrote about your mother and how she made you resilient by the quality of her thorns. It's in the chapter of the flowers. Um, how did your mother make you resilient? Barney, you are going deep. <laughs> we, you can say next question and I will gladly pass. I've got many more. Um, you don't have to answer as well. That's okay. Um, <laughs> part of the story of the flowers. Um, my mother, my mother was violent. Um, yeah, my mother was very violent, and I can feel her in the sting of a thorn. I recognize it. Um, in my fingers but she also looked very beautiful yeah you talked about how you wanted to grow up and 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 be like her and look like her but you took on your dad's genetics so you're a bit you know you grew a bit taller and a bit bigger than what you had hoped for I remember you mentioned that in the book <laughs> it was such a terrible disappointment, <laughs> <laughs> it was such a terrible disappointment. what a bummer <laughs> I was always wanted to be, yeah, my, yeah, she was small. Um, I really want to tell you why I asked these questions because your, yeah. because your work is so, it comes back to that moment, that like that magic dust moment where when you meet someone, they're so distilled in their spirit um, because they've been through so much. That doesn't come from just being born and living a good life you know that comes from pain and grief and agony and yet you still choose joy you still choose a light and you had this amazing caption you you talk about your relationship to pain and you talk about yeah. how death will, you wrote death will come but until it does I will make a study of light oh. how do you choose that people Coming back to who you are, you know, you, you, you have chosen the light every time or you have chosen joy and, and beauty and to chase that all. That's a, that's a choice. That's a willingness to want to see more. And so why, why did you well, choose? The thing is that isn't always what I've chosen. I, um, you know, in my undergraduate and then my postgraduate study and my practice in art and then in flowers um like the notion that I described earlier about the ballet and that transitioning if you like um or re-articulating uh, re pain um into grace and light or darkness into light um I was collecting i I had a realization a few years ago, which is around the time that I wrote that, that I was actually collecting pain in order to have a medium to move into light. Um, right. You wrote, I magnetized pain and transfer, transfigured it into beauty. That's right. Um, and oh my God, it was such a realisation. It was actually a trip that I, I, I made a work in Florence and I was there um, for a few weeks and as soon as I got off the, the train, um, I think I'd been somewhere else and caught the train to Florence and um, I got off the train and saw this massive poster for a, a Marina Abramovich retrospective and um, it was literally, I think it was like four levels um, starting from the basement of the gallery um, to the top floor. And it was a review of all of her work. Um, and I, I, you know, I've always loved her and I was drawn to the pain in her work um, as I was drawn to the pain in a lot of, works of art um and uh I was walking through this ex exhibition and it's so incredible because 
the basement level work was all like people who know her work will know that the earlier works were kind of blood and knives and agony and um uh you know violent brushing of hair and um and by the top level it was entirely light um and crystals and white and beauty and it just fucking landed in me I was like I was just like Marina did it she she made she made she's making work from light and I uh during that the kind of culmination of that trip to Florence was that I was in so much, I'd collected so much darkness that I was in so much physical pain that I could barely eat. Yeah, you wrote down, I courted pain until I could barely stand up. I couldn't eat. I hardly slept. Yeah. And I just couldn't, I was like, and I think the thing was that I wasn't, um, I, I didn't, I didn't want to relinquish the darkness or the pain because I thought that that was uh, the material that I was transfiguring into beauty. I thought I needed it. Um, and yeah, and Marina and a lot of other artists whose, who's, um, you know, works I then looked at again and saw the, the same transition. Um, I was like, they, work can be just as powerful when it is born of light and really it's just unendurable like you you can't your soul and your body can only carry and transfigure darkness for so long and it was during that trip and then it was during that trip that I decided that even if my work was less powerful or yeah that i that i i couldn't i couldn't do it anymore but i think i say something as well in that quote um about still making dark marks in do you have it in front of you i do i do I think I said something about I'll still make marks. I have lived the astonishing dark and I will quote from her wisdom in the course of my work and apply heavy marks in thick black paint in the manner of a punctuation and a dagger. Yes. But there is also light and the pursuit of the staggering beauty of life. Death will come, but until it does, I will make a study of light. Oh, Barney. <laughs> Lisa, it's... Okay, can we just say, yes, you do write poetry? Let's just put that out there. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. Okay, so I have one more area that I really, really want to talk about. In the book you wrote, our personal character is, I believe, largely dictated by where we focus our attention. And so my question is what do you think artists are most distracted by that takes away focus from their medium? Probably other art. <laughs> <laughs> I would say other art. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know because I, I, I don't know because I don't know what everyone else is doing. I try to, for the most part, I try to stay out of it. Um, is that a conscious choice that you make? It's sort of conscious. It's like I, because I get, um, I get so influenced by everything. I'm like, I, I get awed and astonished and affected by absolutely everything that happens. So I, um, yeah, so I can't, I can't let the whole world in. And also I have, a notion that my work will be stronger um, if I am like a racehorse with blinkers on 
and I just fucking run. And so it's def it's conscious. So I, I will do whatever it takes to enliven my practice um, and strengthen it. And that's what I think it takes. Um, and, you know, at art school, there, there was this uh, very definite way of thinking that, um, that, you know, a student of art should just consume every artwork that ever happened and be at every show and, uh, you know, see every exhibition. And, of course, I do go to art galleries and I see work, um, but I, even then, even in the context of art school, I didn't agree with that because I, I need to make art from living and um yeah I think there can be I think that that the I I need a balance I can't kind of um I can't just eat I I eat it all too quickly and yeah right it's just like eating junk food um if it's yeah. like yeah if it's incorrect or if it doesn't um help you but how have you kept your focus though uh, you know among the adversity of your personal life if you have like personal adversity I mean you still got to get up and go to the flower market in the morning how have you kept your focus through I'm an animal that? I'm an animal I just and I'm single-minded and I have I, I and I'm almost religious in my fervor like I which I'm trying to counteract actually I'm consciously trying because I COVID has made me realise that um, I need to be nearer to other people um, and not just the flowers because I, I could, I mean, yeah, I, I, had, um, I had dinner with this artist from New York a little while ago and she was saying <laughs> I was talking I was going on about the flowers and she was like how could a man ever get between you and the flowers and I was like I know it's oh. <laughs> I'm so singular and dedicated and and it is you know what you were saying about when you were talking about your realization that the flowers weren't for you I love all of it. I love um, the, I love, like at the end of the day, you know, I wake up at 3.30 and by 9 p.m. I'm like, I'm so exhausted. I can't see straight and I fucking love it. Oh, my gosh. Um, I, in writing the book, you mentioned it was on an Instagram post where you got I think it was like the manuscript to review and you talked about how excited you were for the book to be published and you said that um, you were dyslexic as a child growing up and so your dad would have been so proud of you and of this book and to have that memory like I work with children between the ages of six to nine so and I understand childhood memories like they're so powerful in the classroom outside the classroom they carry a narrative if you allow it to so how did you not allow the narrative of that stop you from writing your thesis and this book uh the narrative of my being dyslexic yeah uh well you know I think well <laughs> I think actually my being dyslexic um, cause I was profoundly dyslexic. Like I was like, I couldn't, you would have to put my writing up to a mirror to be able to read it. Um, and I think that it's precisely why I wrote a thesis and a book, um, is because, and it's, uh, the reason for my command of words is, um, that they weren't ordinary to me. They were never ordinary to me. They were the most astonishing 
uh, indescribable things that I'd ever come across. I was like, I couldn't understand how everyone could understand. I was like, oh, good God. And then, um, and then <laughs> both my father and my grandfather um, just, they tutored me. They both just read, I, we read books every, we read books constantly and until I could understand words, but um, they were always mysterious and extraordinary to me. They weren't ordinary. I, and I think from what I can see, although I don't know, I think for other people they're, they're ordinary. And so I do, I also have said before that, you know, I don't think anyone has a PhD who didn't need to move a chip on their shoulder. Um, <laughs> it's such it's such a lot of work and it's such a, um, you know, you are, you are trying to prove something yeah. to yourself in the act of it, I think. What have your friendships and your past relationships taught you about life? Oh, that love continues. Um, yeah. I have a very close relationship with the blacksmith who makes all my materials and all of my structures. And he studied um, astronomy and astrophysics before he became blacksmith. And uh, I remember we were talking one day and I always say very poetical things to him that he can't believe are coming out of my mouth. <laughs> and um, he, I said, will that last forever? And he said, nothing in the universe will last forever. And of course, because of his academic background, I took it to heart in that I thought, well, perhaps he knows something. He, perhaps that is true. He must know that. And um, I thought about it for a day and then I messaged him and I said, I've thought of one thing that lasts forever. And he was like, what? And I said, love. Mm. They've all taught me love and about life that, um, which is this, the, you know, the great lesson of the flowers um, is love and its grace. Lisa, thank you for coming on the show. I love you. Oh, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Barney. Thank you so much, Lisa, for coming on the show and having this conversation. Oh, it was amazing. All right, folks, until next time.